going to go ahead and get started. We want to make sure that uh, we have time for questions and, um, and more information at the end. Uh, my name is Laura Axtell. I'm an education specialist. My background is in special ed, um, specifically working with complex cases of dyslexia. I train teachers all over the country and I'm a tutor and have been for about 15 years, um, working generally with children and adults who have um, more complex cases of dyslexia and who need additional support. So I'm really happy to have so many parents on here to talk about this topic because it's a really important one. Um, I just wanna let you know that here's our QR code that if you wanna do that with your phone um, to follow RISE on social media, that'll let you know about future webinars. Um, there's also a free dys dyslexia screener on the website um, that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and the website address is on the bottom. So it's riseliteracy.org. So we'll come back to that at the end as well. Um, so our agenda tonight is gonna look a little like this. We don't have a ton of time, but um, we wanna talk about what causes reading problems. And so for parents, you have there's some things you're gonna need to understand to fully support and intervene for your child. And we're gonna address that first because the more of that information you have, the better. Um, and second, we're going to talk just bri really briefly about how to support students with reading difficulties. And it's we're talking about small steps, but they're important steps. And then the last thing is resources and questions, because a lot of times you come to webinars and people are so busy talking that you never get a chance to ask the questions that you want to ask. Um, and so RISE is on the back end and they're going to be monitoring the chat, putting in some links um, to some resources. And then tomorrow you'll receive an email with a link to the uh, recording of this webinar plus some resources. So uh, we'll try and make sure you have everything you need and then we'll talk about the next uh, webinar. So <clears throat> this is the thing I want to start with and that's that you, if you have a child who's a struggling reader or more than one, you are not alone. So what happens every two years in the world of um, academics is that students are assessed primarily for reading and math this is a random sample throughout the country, um, but students in every state, and it's called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And it's designed to basically identify where we are in terms of how students are doing in those subjects, as well as some other ones. Uh, some grades are assessed on science or social studies or whatever. We, this has been going on every two years, basically, for about three decades. And so in 2019, so this was before COVID, um, those statistics show that only about thir a third of our students are proficient readers in fourth grade and in eighth grade. So that is nothing new. And if you think that you're alone and your child's the only one that's struggling, th these statistics should show you that is clearly not the case. The thing that was really even more surprising, I think, for many people and disheartening is that those test scores in 2019 were actually lower than 2017. And if you wanna put that really in context, these are um, fourth grade and eighth grade raw scores since, 2000, since 1992. So you can see that over here. And you can see that in all these years, that's pretty much a flat line. So if you think about all the time that teachers have spent in training and the money, um, the billions of dollars we've spent on materials and the time and effort that's gone into reading, and actually we're not getting any better. In fact, from 2017, the, the data shows we got a little worse at both fourth and eighth grade. So clearly what we've been doing isn't working, and, and there are millions of children out there who are also struggling. So a lot of parents feel alone and their children feel alone because they don't realize that it's such a pervasive problem around the country. So we wanna start by talking about what causes reading problems and you're feel free to put questions in the chat, but we will have time at the end to, to address some of those as well. So this is what we have to understand first is that all reading is a neurological activity. Everything happens in the brain. And when, we, when babies are born, they are naturally wired for speech. That means if they can hear and they're surrounded by language, they're gonna to learn to speak that language. And in many cases, multiple languages because the brain is just naturally wired to talk. So even when kids are have significant speech delays, 
unless there's another factor, they're always going to catch up. They may need um, speech support. They may need help with, you know, articulation and things like that. But eventually they will catch up. The reading brain is the exact opposite. Reading is not a natural activity for the brain. It has to be wired to connect to print. So about 60% of, of children um, have brains that naturally do connect to print once they've had instruction because print is a code. And once they know the code, they're able to decode and read, write, and spell pretty, you know, pretty adequately. But about 40% of students aren't. Their brains are not wired for print. And that can be a variety of reasons, but the most common reason is dyslexia. And so what's important to understand is that when we say children will catch up, that's true in speech, but it's the exact opposite in print. If kids don't get the intervention they need to wire the brain for print, they're gonna get further and further behind. And so what we're having to do with those students is build a, a network of robust neural um, connections that will activate and support and connect those language centers in the brain. And you can see that that primarily happens on the left hemisphere of the brain. You're actually gonna see some brain scans in a minute um, where a lot of that speech happens. But then once we connect to reading, we're talking about a whole lot of other parts. Um, and so targeted instruction of a specific kind is really needed to create those neural pathways. And orthographic mapping, I just want to talk about this briefly. See this little box that's blue that says MOI? More, mental orthographic imaging is when the brain recognizes a word on sight. So what we've always called sight words. So when a student knows that T-H-E is the, and they just automatically recognize it, even though it's not spelled the way it's pronounced, then we know the brain has stored that as a, an orthographic image, right? And the more, and the more words that students store, the more fluently, accurately, and automatically they can decode. So what we know is that we have to help the brain do that. And we have to give students many, many exposures to words so that they can store those words. Um, and so that's a really, that's something that we've got to embed in our instruction. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, I love this quote because if you're a parent of a struggling reader, it will make so much sense to you. Steven Pinker, who's a cognitive neuroscientist said, neuropsychologist said, children are wired for sound, but print is an optional accessory that must be painstakingly bolted on. And if you've ever worked with a struggling reader where they are struggling over every word, where they, it is very slow and laborious. And by the time they get to the end of a sentence, they've forgotten what they read. That is an apt description, painstakingly bolted on. And so the reading brain is, you know, this very complex um, organism that we have to make ensure that we have given the right kinds of tools to support, to work with reading, right? So if you boil all the science and everything down to what reading comprehension really is, it's two main components. The first thing is you have to be able to decode the word. You have to know what the word is. And the second thing is you have to know what the word means. Um, or if you're an English language learner, you have to know what the word means in English. And that doesn't seem all that challenging, except that, you know, decoding, there's a lot to, that goes on in decoding English words and spelling. And language comprehension includes all those things like vocabulary and um, syntax and, you know, morphology and all the things that you have to know about how English works. Um, and this is a product, not a sum. So if, so this times this equals this, right? So if a student struggle, it can't decode, no matter how well they understand what people are talking about, they may have very strong oral vocabularies, but if they can't decode the words, zero times one is still zero. And even when their decoding skills may increase a little bit, those, however much they're limited by their decoding is going to show up in their comprehension. That's true in the opposite too. If a student can decode very well, but doesn't know what the words mean, they're still going to have very limited um, reading comprehension. And unfortunately, most reading assessments are measuring comprehension. That's what they're looking for. So when the National Reading Panel was um, report was um, presented in 2000, so that's been 21 years ago, what it showed is this is what it takes to build effective reading instruction. These are the components. Phonemic awareness, which is the speech sounds. So students have to be able to hear and discriminate and manipulate speech sounds. 
So for example, when they're little, we might say, you know, how many syllables are in your name? Or we might clap um, syllables. We might work, to work on rhyming and things like that. But as we get into school, students have to know that words are made up of individual sounds and that you can do things with them. So for example, if we, we can change mat to cat, we can change mat to um, mat to tap and we can split and we can reverse that to pat. So there's so many things that students have to know about how words work and they're made up of individual sounds, those speech sounds, right? And then we have to connect to print. So that's where decoding comes in. So now we can connect, you know, um, how we build words and how we connect. So sub segmenting and blending is what it's called. You have to be able to segment words into individual sounds and you have to be able to blend individual sounds into um, whole words. And that's really important, but some kids can't do that. So they, we need to address that. Fluency has gotten kind of um, uh, mis a lot of misunderstandings about fluency. So if you're a parent and it's likely that at some point in your child's history, you have gotten some sort of report that said your student was in, your child was in the red on fluency. That's usually from an assessment like Dibbles or another reading assessment in the early grades that measures oral reading fluency. That's called an ORF. And what that, what parents often say is, oh my gosh, you know, their, their fluency is low or the teachers will even say that. The problem is that when you're not reading you know, accurately, automatically, and, you know, fluently, there's a, usually a problem below that, um, like decoding. It means you don't decode well accurately and automatically. So, of course, it's going to connect to fluency. So, rather than try and artificially work on fluency, and a lot of times they'll send fluency packets home and things like that, you want to look at why aren't they decoding fluently, and it's usually because there's a problem with decoding. Um, and we're going to talk about that more in a second. The other one, as we mentioned, is vocabulary. So kids have to know what words mean. And a lot of times they just don't. Um, and we can spend a little bit more time talking about that too. But the goal is comprehension. Um, and we know now that the way we have to teach these components is not leaving it open for kids to figure out on their own, surrounding them with really interesting reading material and giving them choice is never going to um, create skilled readers. Um, that whole language model only, it works for a limited number of students, that what this means is we have to prov provide explicit instruction, systematically um, and planned and organized, and it has to move from simple to more complex for students, that 40% of students who need it. So these are the components of reading, but this is where it really comes, um, kind, kind of comes out in the wash. So if you get a measure or your students are taking something like map testing or star testing or one of those reading assessments, and it shows that they, they have, quote, poor reading comprehension, you want to back it down. Well, if they've got poor reading comprehension, is it because they're reading so slowly they can't hold on to it? So let's look at their fluency. But if they've got poor fluency, then we need to back down the pyramid from there to poor word recognition. And then we have to, you know, so the bottom line is that pyramid is there for a reason. Everything is built on those steps that lead to comprehension. So when somebody tells me that a student has, you know, a problem with poor comprehension or fluency, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Has, that, has anybody assessed their phonemic awareness and decoding skills? Because that's where we need to look first. This, I think, is what's really helpful, and it would be great if um, when we get to questions or whatever, you could identify where you think your child or children are in this continuum. So when we talk about those two components of reading, we said decoding or word reading is one component, and the other is language comprehension, which is vocabulary, knowing what the words mean. Well, we can pretty much divide all readers into four groups. The first type of readers are proficient readers. They're students, children who are able to they code well and they have strong vocabulary. So most proficient readers, if you've got multiple children, there, it's likely that at least one of your kids might be um, an average reader. They're reading on grade level. They haven't had a lot of difficulties because they're strong in both areas. But some of you may have children who are what's called mixed reading difficulty, which means they're weak in both areas. So they struggle with decoding. They struggle with vocabulary, um, you know, understanding what they're reading, inference, that kind of stuff. Then there are students who are called now called hyperlexics or hyperlexia, 
Um, that in the past has sometimes been called word callers. So those are kids who actually are generally strong at decoding. They actually can come out looking average on the decoding, you know, like when they're reading a passage or a decoding or a comprehension test because they're reading pretty well, like on an oral reading fluency. But when you start looking at it, they don't understand what they're reading. They often have lots of difficulty at the word level or spelling. And they often really struggle with things like inference. So their decoding looks really good. They can read well um, because they're word callers, but they don't understand what they're reading. So they're weak in the language comprehension piece. And a fair number from the research, a fair number of those students are maybe on the autism spectrum. So are high functioning kids with Asperger's or whatever, often um, that's an issue for them. And then the last category are students with um, dyslexia. And those students can often be very strong in oral language, but it's the print, it's the decoding piece that really is a struggle for them. And since we know this, what we need to do is help identify where's the gap. If you got a proficient reader, then great. But if you don't, and you've got a struggling, a child who's struggling with reading, where's the problem? Is it decoding? Is it language comprehension? Or is it both? Because that really helps to provide more information and in, in intervention. Um, if you have an older child, and when I say older, I mean past fourth grade who is struggling with reading, this will help you understand how that happens. So I was secondary. I would, worked a lot with middle school and high school and um, still do work with a lot of older students and adults. And teachers often say, well, how can a student get to be in fourth grade or eighth grade or 10th grade and they're reading on a second grade level? And this is how that happens. When students are in kindergarten to third grade, they are learning to read. The words are really simple, that we spend lots of time learning to read, they have sometimes decodable text and things like that. And so kids can look like they're making progress. Why? Because sometimes they have great strategies, like they're really good memorizers, or they have very good auditory memory. And, you know, they can get by, but they get to fourth grade and that changes. Now what happens is we go from learning to read to reading to learn, which means we're expecting students to be able to independently read text and understand it on their own, and then often to do something with it, like take a quiz or write a you know, paragraph or respond to a prompt or something like that. Well, whatever strategies work when you're in K-3 are not gonna generally work beyond third grade because now the words are much more complex, multisyllabic words, subject specific text, um, you know, the, the volume is so great that they can't memorize everything or use auditory memory. And what happens is they start to plateau, which means that they get to a certain point and then they just don't get any better. So a lot of students, where, wherever the last set of skills were that they could gain and hold on to, that's where they stop. And even if you look at adult literacy rates, um, the person who did the research on this, Chal, called it the fourth grade slump, it's really more like a fourth to sixth grade slump. Um, because if you look at adult illiteracy rates, that's about where many adults also stop, fourth to sixth grade. Um, and so the whole point is that we've got a problem early on that isn't really addressed because we don't identify it. And then we just kind of keep moving students on. The issue now is that we've got a lot of kids in second and third grade um, who are gonna be moving into fourth and fifth grade. Um, after two years of instruction during COVID, um, which has been, I guess, what I would say diplomatically is less than ideal situations. So we're going to have kids, if we think our NAEP scores were already not looking very good, they're probably not going to get better. They're probably going to get worse. And we're going to have more and more kids who end up in upper grades with reading difficulties. <clears throat> so as we know, even at fourth grade, only 35% of students are proficient readers and 34% at eighth grade. So, you know, this is an, uh, this has been a long-term problem and it's not getting better. So <clears throat> the thing that we have to understand is when we're talking about the brain um, and these two components of reading comprehension, that an effective reader prime, has three primary language centers on the left hemisphere of the brain all wired together. We already talked about that. But a student with dyslexia often doesn't. Those neural pathways aren't, they don't exist. So they have to be built. They have to be created. And that is neurology. You're, you're building neural pathways, which means you have to be doing certain things in a certain way to do that. 
This is not about comprehension strategies. This is not about close reading. This is not, I'm gonna send you more, um, I'm gonna send you more reading material to try and improve your comprehension. You have to go back and wire the brain. And structured literacy has been found to be the most effective way to do that. It's great for all kids and it's you know absolutely essential for kids with dyslexia. And we just have to be um, aware that the, the research shows that about one in every five kids, so 20% of all people have some characteristics of dyslexia. So again, this is a really widespread problem. Um, and if you've got a child with dyslexia, there are things you need to know um, and ways you're gonna probably need to intervene depending on where your school district is and things like that. So let's start by defining dys dyslexia. So you can see if this matches what you're seeing based on what we just talked about. So um, this is a definition from the International Dyslexia Association. If you've never gone on their website, IDA is a really good place to find a lot of information. Um, but most states now that have dyslexia legislation um, have adopted this definition as, um, as their dyslexia definition. So it says dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. What that means is obviously it's happening in the brain. So these um, neural networks, but it's biological because um, um, dyslexia has a very high genetic component, which means that often it is inherited by a uh, family member, a, an immediate family member. So what we know is that if you have a, if there's a parent with dyslexia or a grandparent or, you know, a sibling or something like that, there's a very good chance that at least some of the offspring will also have dyslexia. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine um, is an educator. Her husband has dyslexia. They have four children. Two of their children have dyslexia. Two of their children don't. So it's somewhere between, it sounds like lately the research is saying 50 to 60% chance that a student with a family history will have dyslexia, some form of dyslexia. So it's good to be aware of that because a family history is a really important um, component of screening if there's a family history. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding. So if your child is struggling and this is what they're struggling with, difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition so they don't seem to get it when they, they don't, they haven't mapped a lot of words. And so they keep saying the same word over and over again. If you've worked with a child who struggles, often what you'll see is they'll come to a word that they don't know, like the word water. And then they'll, you'll say it's water and then they'll say the word. And then the next page, you'll see the same word and they'll act like they've never seen it before. Or they'll be reading a story where the same character's name is repeated over and over again, and they just can't hold on to it. That's because it isn't mapped, and that is a really common characteristic of dyslexia. But also spelling and, and just so many issues connecting to you know, how they can decode and spell are um, big red flags for dyslexia. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language, so again, those sounds, that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. So if a student is at, so if there's no other factors like um, intellectual impairments or traumatic brain injury or hearing loss or something like that, and they have had adequate instruction and there's still an unexpected um, you know, problem, then that's what defines dyslexia. Given the fact that the student has the ability and they've had the instruction and they're still not getting it, what else would it be? Right? Why would a why would a ten year old or a fourteen year old or a thirty eight year old not be able to read if all the other factors were even? Right. Um, so this is the part that gets where sometimes people get um, kind of confused. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. That's not the primary um, consequence, it's the secondary con co consequence for the reasons we talked about. If you can't decode and you don't understand what the words mean, of course you're gonna have problems in um, reading comprehension. But what they're saying really when they say reduced reading experience is that kids that don't read well, don't like to read. 
generally. And so what they'll do is they'll avoid it or they won't do very much of it. And that causes a problem with vocabulary and background knowledge because past third grade, most of the vocabulary we'll ever gain is where what we get from what we read. So if kids don't read and they hate to read and avoid reading, they're going to be limiting themselves in other ways as well. And that just makes the problem worse. So I want to show you some brain scans. Um, this is actually from a webinar that you can watch on YouTube called Curing Dyslexia, What is Possible by Dr. Um, Patricia Mathis. And um, she showed some brain scans during the webinar, which is a really fascinating um, resource if you want to watch it. But she showed some brain scans and um, this was from research at Tufts and Harvard with fifth graders. So this was not your, you know, your really, really young children. And what we want, to, since we've talked about the brain so much, I want to show you what I mean by that. So these are real brain scans from that study. And you can see that this is a typical neurotypical reader, somebody who doesn't have reading difficulties. And when you're looking at the back side of the brain, look at where all the activity is. So this shows um, the more activity, the brighter red or yellow or you know green all the way down to dark, right? So a neurotypical reader, when they're reading, the brain is going to light up mostly on the left side of the brain. That makes sense because that's where the language centers are. So when you look at the side view from the uh, left, you're going to see that's where most of the activity is happening. And then when you look at the from the left, I'm sorry, on the right side, there's not much going on there. It's not that the brain isn't, all of the brain isn't functioning. It's just that most of the um, activity connected directly to reading is happening on the left side. So the students in the study that had dyslexia also had brain scans. And what you can see when you look at the back of their brain is that most of the activity is happening on the right side of the brain. So when you look at the left side where this activity should be happening, it's not happening there, it's happening here on the right side of the brain. So when people say that kids are lazy or they're not doing anything or they're not trying, that's not true. They can be working you know, twice or three times as hard as a, a typical reader, the problem is that is not happening in the right areas of the brain. And so it doesn't matter how hard they work, how much time they spend, because it's not, those language centers aren't um, effective. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting about this, um, and this is a theory, so nobody's proven this, but um, you can maybe see if this applies to some of your kids. Um, if you have a student and you think that's happening, a lot of times, because so much activity is the right side of the brain, the right side of the brain is where a lot of the other kinds of creative things happen. Um, a lot of students who have reading you know, language issues, which is mostly a left side of brain activity, are, are often very creative, artistic, musical, very good at sports, um, really good you know, verbal reasoning skills, those kinds of things. And that may be because their brain on the right side is really, really actively working. And so they've developed some of those additional skills. It's almost like a compensation. Um, and then what happens when we look at those brain, same brains, so the same brains here with dyslexia, after a year of intervention. So these are fifth graders. After a year of invention, intervention, look what happens. So their left hemisphere now is activating actually even a little bit more than a typical reader. And when you look at the left hemisphere now, it's doing exactly what it should be doing. So it's normalized. And so is the right brain. So that's really helpful because what we know is this works and we have lots and lots of data to prove it. So Dr. Mathis in the webinar makes the statement and she's right, age matters and it matters a lot. If we are really going to prevent reading difficulties, we wanna identify and intervene as early as possible because remember, they're not gonna get any better. They're gonna get worse if they don't get that intervention, the higher the grade they go. So what her key takeaways were is that when it's provided early, you can basically eliminate any negative impacts of dyslexia because children at risk who learn to read um, at normal levels at the end of first grade continue to perform at normal levels across the grades. That's pretty amazing. If we wait until they're past first grade into second, third, fifth, eighth, tenth, our adults, then guess what? There's gonna be lots of impact from uh, limited reading ability. Um, and those um, impacts are not just academic, they're also so, uh, social and emotional. So what that means is, you know, reading is comprised of a lot of different things. Um, and 
we, you know, you need all of those things to become a skilled reader. But um, what that means is in the beginning, we have to focus on the decoding skills because now what we know is everybody's brain learns to read in only one way and it's bottom up. So we have to focus first on the strands to create those decoding skills to automaticity. So phonemic awareness, the same things we've been talking about, decoding and encoding, allowing the brain to see patterns, et cetera. This has to come first. You can't overload kids with um, literature and background knowledge and vocabulary at the same time you're trying to do this because this has to become automatic before they can even attend to those other skills. What happens when they get into upper grades is that we're throwing all these strands at them and it's going to take time and years to get to that point. Um, so a lot of times what happens is students just get overwhelmed and it's exhausting for them. Um, so to summarize that, and that's, and this is what parents need to know to effectively advocate for their child is you have to have some understanding of what's happening and, and why this is so important. Um, and so to summarize the science, I love Stephanie Soller. You can find a lot of her stuff on the, on YouTube or, um, on Google. Um, so basically she summarized the science of reading and what we know about what reading, um, by, by saying these six things, number one, reading isn't natural. So it's not like everybody does it. It's easy for everybody. That's not the case. Everyone learns to read in the same way. We talked about that bottom up. There's a known pathway for reading. So we have so much research now. We know exactly how the brain learns to read and what it needs to read. Um, some students acquire this pathway more easily than others. They're in the 60%, which leaves about 40% of students who won't ever acquire it naturally on their own. Explicit and systematic instruction works better for all children. So nobody has to be left um, as a, you know, with limited reading skills. And prevention is easier and cheaper than intervention. So the earlier, again, we connect and um, provide intervention for students, the better. Um, so moving to structured literacy, because structured literacy has been found to be the most effective way of providing this type of reading instruction. Um, so I just want to make sure you know what that is. Um, on the outer on the outer rings are the teaching principles. This is adapted from the National Reading Pier, um, Panel Pyramid that we saw earlier. So some of those words are going to be the same. The principles of structured literacy are it has to be explicit. That means every skill is provided by in, with instruction um, clearly and with modeling. Um, the second thing is it has to be systematic. So there has to be a plan and a sequence that moves across teachers, across grade levels, et cetera. It shouldn't matter what teacher A is doing compared to teacher B and second grade and third grade. That should be a continuum. Students need certain things in kindergarten. They need to take those skills and expand on them in first grade and all the way up. Um, but a lot of times that's not in place at all. There is no system. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing or using different curriculum or whatever. Um, it also has to be cumulative. That means students have to start with simple and build on certain really essential skills. And they have to become proficient in those skills before you can move them on. What happens though is uh, students don't often have the opportunity to um, demonstrate proficiency or lack of proficiency. And they just we just keep moving them on. And they get into more and more advanced skills without having the foundation or you know, the ability to apply even easier skills, and now they're their way into that plateau. And then the last one is diagnostic and responsive. That means that the teacher needs to see enough to be able to tell when a student is confused about something, isn't proficient, is struggling in a particular area so that they can provide corrective feedback right away. And a good example of that is reversals. So for example, lots of kids reverse their Bs and their Ds and sometimes um, Ps and Qs and all of that. Developmentally, that can often occur until about age seven. But in kindergarten, we actually could correct that. We don't wanna just let them keep um, having reversals because many of those kids will take those reversals right into upper grades. I see lots of kids in the upper grades who still reverses, reverse their Bs and Ds and nobody ever has ever stopped them to correct that. And that can impact their reading, writing, and spelling way more than we know. Um, we could talk more about that, but just reversals alone is a great example of how 
you know, we have got to provide these kids with the skills right from the beginning and as quickly as possible if it's later in life. Inside is what we're teaching. So that's what you should be seeing from a structured literacy curriculum. It should start with phonology, which is the sounds and then connects directly to the letters um, at sometimes called the alphabetic principle or sound symbol correspondence. Um, and then from there, we need to get into syllables, the understanding of how English actually works, starting with single syllables and then multisyllabic words. Um, morphology is really important because a lot of kids don't get it. And without explicit instruction, they may never get it. So for example, some of it's really pretty easy. Um, if we have the word dog, that's singular, a noun. Um, if we add an S, then that becomes plural, right? So we go from dog to dogs. Um, and that little S actually has meaning. It makes something more than one, right? But sometimes it's a little more complex than that. So we might say, give me a cookie or give me the cookie. What's the difference between a cookie or the cookie, right? Um, and students don't get those variations a lot of times because they're so focused on decoding the words, they can't even pay attention to things like meaning. Um, and then syntax and semantics are word order, you know, how we speak, how we write in English and semantics are word meaning. So, you know, do crying, weeping and sobbing all mean exactly the same thing? No, they don't. So when you're reading, you have to be aware of what words mean and even connotations of words to really get what a writer or author is trying to say. And a lot of struggling readers skip right over that. They don't even they'll read a whole page or a paragraph and it's literally like they didn't even read the page because you'll ask them a question and they'll, they won't be able to answer it. It's like they didn't even get that that happened. A lot of times what you'll hear is OG or Orton Gillingham um, that schools will say, oh, we're using an Orton Gillingham program or um, our teachers are, are OG trained or something like that. And that's just something else for parents to be aware of. Um, Orton Gillingham is based on a name, um, two names actually, Samuel Orton, who was a um, neuropsychiatrist and, psych and pathologist. But look at the years. This is way back. This is like, um, he died in 1950. So we had a lot of information from him. And Anna Gillingham was an educator. And the two of them came to that understanding that the brain is where all of this is happening. And that there were certain things that needed to happen to wire the brain. Right, so the, the Orton Gillingham approach has been around for quite a long time. We know what we need to do, um, but it is not a program or curriculum. So teachers can be trained on Orton Gillingham, but there's not an Orton Gillingham curriculum. That's where schools have to decide, first of all, how they wanna train their teachers. So they should have an understanding of these approaches, but also what are you gonna use to, in the classroom to teach students um, the structured literacy approach. So this is just some of the things that we've already talked about, shown up again and again. Um, so that's where the National Reading Panel and structured literacy and all that stuff comes from, it's OG. So, you know, that personalized, multi-sensory, direct instruction, systematic, that's where it comes from. So when they talk about OG, that's what they're talking about. So um, let's stop and take questions. Does anybody have any questions about that? Oh, so does the proficient level mean that they're reading at, so when we're going back to the NAEP scores and we're talking about only a third of students read proficient, yes, they're talking about reading at their grade level. And if they are not reading, does that mean that 65% are below their grade level? Yes. So only 35 or one third of students are proficient reading at grade level. Any other questions about anything we've talked about so far? If there are, just go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll address them. I'm going to make this really simple. I'm just going to talk about a couple things because supporting a struggling reader is the job, you know, that's our job as parents. Um, nobody can support our child. Nobody knows our child the way we do and nobody can support our child the way we can. So these are just a couple of simple little things that I want to talk about and then we can discuss it from there. But one thing is to understand that this is not something your kid shows. It's not that they're not working hard. It's not that, um, you know, they are purposely trying to do this. So the first thing is that parents, it helps if parents understand the emotional and social consequences of reading difficulties. We send these little children off to school every day and they spend six hours or more every single day 
doing something that for some of them is impossible or at the very least really, really challenging because reading happens in every single class. It used to be that if you were good in math, you could get around it a little bit because you could do math, you know, but now all the math is embedded in word problems and the students struggle in math even because they can't read the word problems or they don't understand it. So, you know, trying to hide the fact that you don't read um, well or that your spelling is exhausting and it can take a huge toll. There's actually a lot more research coming out about the trauma that students experience when they can't read. And sometimes that's because somebody's told them, oh, you're stupid or you're not trying or, you know, you're lazy or something like that. But a lot of times it's their real anxiety um, and even depression about going to school and you know, the teacher may call on them to read in front of their peers. It's really, it's, I cannot understate this or overstate this enough that there, there is some real emotional issues that are connected when you can't read. And most, for most kids, what they'll tell you is they're stupid. If all of their peers can read and they can't, what else can, what other conclusion would a first grader come to, you know, other than there must be something wrong with me. So that's a huge issue. And so one of the things we can do is provide as much support as possible with things like homework and technology. Um, for example, if your student needs help with having something read to them at home or, um, or they can use some sort of assistive technology like speech to text or text to speech to help with things, there are lots of apps now, many of them are free that can support that. But the other thing as a parent that really you have to do is communicating with the school and getting intervention where possible or at the very least running interference. So if they're sending home a lot of work for your child and where that might take most kids an hour of homework, it's gonna take your child three hours of homework. At some point you need to say it's too much. This is what they can reasonably do. And this is what they will do. Um, because the bottom line is until schools can, pro can provide that kind of intervention, or when it's until a student has an IEP or 504 plan that allows them to have accommodations, these kids every day are um, struggling. They're in the deep end of the pool and they don't know how to swim. And that's, you know, really, really not fair to them, but they also can't advocate for themselves in that way. They can't say, I'm not gonna do the homework or I'm not gonna do all the homework or whatever. That's really where parents come in. The other thing is you, it really helps if you can make sure that your child has outlets that are not connected to school at all, definitely not connected to reading, and is something they love and enjoy and um, shows that they are really good at something. And we mentioned some of those earlier, you know, when they're really artistic or musical or sports oriented or whatever. Um, I remember talking to a parent of a child who clearly had dyslexia, but of course the parents didn't know that. And the dad was really upset because the student was failing a lot of their classes. And so they pulled him from sports and, and it was a punishment basically because your grades aren't good. So you have to work harder. And I was like, please don't do that. Please let that child be in sports and do whatever else they want to do that makes them feel good about themselves and is not connected to school because that's in the end what is going to preserve their self-esteem um, and allow them to understand that school is temporary. We just need to get you through school as much as possible. Um, and reinforce your child's belief in themselves because dyslexia or reading difficulties aren't at all connected to intelligence. Um, so there's no correlation at all. So I sometimes tell kids, you can be the smartest kid in your class and still have reading problems. And they don't believe that. <laughs> it's true, but they don't believe it. Um, the other thing is, as a parent, one thing that can really support you is finding something like a decoding dyslexia chapter or parent support group. Sometimes parent information centers or dyslexia centers have information, parent support groups and things like that, because this isn't something generally you're going to want to do on your own. The more information you have, the more you know about how you can support your child, the better. But start with the little things that when they come home from school, that we don't make a big deal about it, that we limit what we're forcing our kids to do when they are doing their very best and that we take on that advocacy role for them. So resources, I just wanna mention a couple. Um, we're gonna put some links in the chat. Um, this is a webinar that we did for um, several years ago now um, with a parent, uh, well, actually two parents um, and two educators 
where we talked about this very discussion about how can parents work with their school to provide resources, to get kids intervention, to start the process of, of identifying a problem and then get doing something about that. So sometimes that's really helpful if you can just hear and watch what other parents are saying. And there's some resources that go along with that. Um, oops, I'm not gonna play that. Um, there's also a free dyslexia screener on the RISE website. So um, we will let you know the RISE website, but there's a free dyslexia screener. And what it happens is that you do the screener for your child. So they won't, there was nothing that they will take. Um, you'll, you'll identify their age and then it'll open a screener that's called a non-diagnostic risk screener. And it'll ask you a bunch of questions about what you have seen with your child. It'll ask about family history. It'll ask about things like ear infections when they were children. It'll ask about you know speech delays or language um, issues. And then it'll talk a lot about what you have, what you see when they're reading and things like that. And at the end, there's a printable page that um, says, these are all the characteristics that you answered yes or sometimes to, and out of how many. So um, there's one for four and five-year-olds, one for six and seven-year-olds, and then one for eight to adult. So that can be really helpful just for you to get a better idea of, you know, <laughs> are these characteristics of dyslexia that I'm seeing? If they are, it's usually pretty apparent. Um, I mentioned that parent webinar um, that we're gonna provide the link to, but also this is a parent guide that came out of that webinar. And so it's multiple pages long. And basically what it does is it starts with the steps here. So creating a record, initiating a conversation with an educator, collecting information, seeing if your state has a dyslexia handbook, scheduling a meeting, meeting with your pediatrician. Like these are kind of all the steps and it's a guide that walks you through all of those. And that can be a really useful place to start if you're at the beginning of this journey. Um, collecting information is really, really helpful. Um, I worked with a student and he, just the written work that he was doing, you could tell this child is in fifth grade and you couldn't read most of what he wrote. He couldn't even read what he was writing. And yet he's average or above average intelligence, but struggles a lot with decoding. And then when it came to writing so much difficulty. And so I just started having her collect all of that. Just, you know, bring home, have him bring home and start a folder with that because that is work product or samples. And that's important for educators to see a history of. And again, you know, Talk about how much time it's taking for your child to do homework, et cetera. Um, so again, if, here's the QR code. So if you want to follow RISE, we've got some upcoming um, events and resources. So we're going to talk about questions. We're going to take some questions here in a second. Um, hold on. Where did my little cursor go? <laughs> hold on. It went somewhere. Well, we're almost to the last slide, so that's a good thing, I guess. I guess this gives you more time to uh, do the QR code. All right, well, I'm not going to worry about that so much then, um, because I do see we have some questions and I want to make sure we address them. Um, so. We do have a web, the, the thing that was on the last slide is we do have a webinar coming up on March 24th, the next webinar. Um, and that will focus on really intervention. So understanding RTI, what does that mean when you're, when they say your kid's going to be in tier two and tier three, what do, is a 504 plan and what's its value? What is an IEP and how does that differ from a 504 plan? Um, those kinds of specific things that are helpful. Um, and um, Jessica, I can't, um, I can't find my cursor. To, oh, here we go. Now I can see it. Sorry. So this is the next webinar um, on Thursday, um, the 24th. Okay. So now let's talk about Let's go back. Okay, so let's talk about get your, testing your child for dyslexia. So 
Um, most states do not recognize the ability of schools to quote diagnose dyslexia because they say it's a medical disorder diagnosis and that's not true. Um, if it were a medical diagnosis, then there would be a medical treatment, right? So if you go and you have um, pneumonia, then there's a medical treatment. Or if you have a broken leg, there's a medical treatment, right? When you go to your pediatrician, first of all, most of them have never had any training in assessing for, di for dyslexia, and they certainly can't treat it. So just the same way in which we assess all learning disabilities, of course, schools can determine that a student has a specific learning disability in reading. However, most states have been reluctant to label that as dyslexia. Now, sometimes they'll say, oh, you can't put the word dyslexia in an IEP or a 504 plan. That's not true. You can put it in the notes. However, most of the time, what's going to happen is they're going to assess your child doing a battery at the school if they do that. And then they're going to, if your child qualifies, then they'll say they have a specific learning disability in reading. It won't say specifically dyslexia. If you are looking for a dyslexia diagnosis, almost always parents are going to have to go to an outside evaluator. That's usually a neuropsychologist. Um, it's, it can be wickedly expensive. We're talking thousands of dollars. And even then, schools don't have to accept the results. They take that as a form, one form of data, but they don't have to accept um, your, the, you know, the testing evaluation. Um, I don't worry so much about getting students diagnosed with dyslexia because I just go back to the definition. If they're struggling and it's unexpected and they've had appropriate and, and, you know, um, instruction like every other kid in their class and they're not getting it, what else could it be? It's dyslexia. So I don't care what you call it. Uh, we just need to go ahead and intervene and solve the issue. Um, yeah, so sometimes you have to. You have to get a... Um, uh, so the, the question is, what can I do to help my, to get my child extra help? She's in second grade and is getting an ILP set up, but I feel like I need to find a tutor or something to help her outside of school. That's often the case. The problem is that um, that can be expensive as well because your child's going to need, you know, at least once a week, sometimes multiple times during a week. Um, the schools need to be providing that information. We just have to help teachers get a, and district administrators get a better understanding of what needs to happen in schools, we're more than capable of doing this. It's happening all over the country now. Some states just are not as far along as others, but really that's the whole purpose of a free and appropriate public education is that your child gets what they need. And if we were doing that efficiently, we wouldn't have so many kids who needed IEPs because they would have been getting reading intervention long before that, right? Um, so yeah, if you can find resources outside of your school to support your child, absolutely, but the best course of action is to provide that in school um, where it's free. Um, and if they're on, if they do get classified, then obviously special ed kicks in. And if they're on an IEP, they'll get accommodations and modifications and things like that. That doesn't guarantee though that they're gonna get an Orton-Gillingham-based research-based um, reading program or intervention. So being on an IEP doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna improve reading and that's unfortunate. Um, the different types of reading difficulties, again, um, you will get a, this, what, what, this webinar will be mailed to you tomorrow as a link, but the four types are, you know, proficient reader who's strong in both areas, mixed reading difficulty, they're weak in both areas, hyperlexia, they're good decoders, not good at comprehension, and then students with dyslexia often are very good at language comprehension, but weak in decoding. Uh, I'm a behavior analyst and a parent to a child with ADHD and auditory processing. He struggles with spelling and memory. Also my oldest child with ASD and hyperlexia. My child with hyperlexia is doing um, VV. What other tools can I use to work on reading comprehension? If not appropriate to ask here, I understand and my apologies. No, but what I would do is go on the um, RISE website and, um, tech and send us a message and we'll follow up with you. Um, are there other neurological disorders that dyslexia can be confused with? Yes and no. Um, I mean, there are other neurological issues, but really that's where you start teasing it out. And where I would start is by taking the screener because so what other kinds of neurological disorders are there? There are, I mean, everything that we're talking about here happens in the brain. 
So if you have central auditory processing disorder, for example, that obviously is neurological because the brain is not processing speech in the same way. And even phonemic awareness difficulties are neurological. So lots of kids can't, the brain cannot hear or discriminate the sounds. And so you have to address those, but we wanna look and see, is there anything else that we know of? For example, um, is there a brain injury or hearing loss or whatever? Sometimes that's the case. A lot of kids with reading difficulties had either lots of ear infections, needed tubes in their ears, were never, you know, never fully treated for ear infections and things like that. And then the brain couldn't hear those speech sounds. And that can, it doesn't cause dyslexia, but it certainly contributes to reading difficulties. So yes, there can be, but the whole point is you want to look for the characteristics of dyslexia first um, to see how that shakes out. Um, how does one who homeschools not associated with the school district get a diagnosis and find a qualified dyslexia tutor? Um, start by, as I mentioned, seeing what is available as parent support. So decoding dyslexia is parents who, with children of dyslexia, um, parents of children with dyslexia in every state, there's a chapter. So go to, your, just look up decoding dyslexia in your state and see if you can get in contact with them. These are parents who are often extremely knowledgeable, have worked with the school systems, um, have often been the leading force in getting legislation passed for dyslexia in their states. Um, so these folks are usually the best place to start. Um, check and see if there is a reading center. Sometimes they're associated with colleges or universities. Um, sometimes they'll actually just advertise. So you'll be able to see, you know, tutors that focus um, on dyslexia. But you, again, you just want to make sure you get somebody that is good. Um, and so you want to check around, find out, find other parents who have, you know, used that service or whatever. Um, sometimes you'll there will be a really good teacher or retired teacher, or whatever, who also works um, with students um, privately. And as long as they're qualified and have worked effectively with other students, then sometimes they're really good too. Um, okay, so let's talk about these other ones. Um, any website where I get ideas on how to help my kid with dyslexia? So I know you asked that a while ago. I'd go back to what we just talked about. Um, how can a parent get a legit review being analyzed of dyslexia? I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I would start with the screener. It's for every item on that screener, there is also a, a link that you, or a little button that you can click on that says, see the research or view research. And it'll tell you where the research came from for that item. So everything on that screener is based on the research. Any recommendations on what to do if my student does not qualify from the testing or extra help but clearly has dyslexia? Um, yeah, get some additional testing, first of all. Um, so, and sometimes this means you will need to find somebody, um, an educational advocate, parent information center decoding dyslexia, somebody who can look at the testing results. So one thing right off the bat, and it says this in the parent guide, but you wanna keep copies of everything. So if they, send you information, make, start a file, keep that because you're, or if it's digitally, that's fine too. But I just had a parent email me their child's psycho educational evaluation a little while ago so I could look at it. And there were clearly indicators. So I'm not sure what the school was talking about, <laughs> but um, when homeschooling a dyslexia fifth and ninth graders, the Reading Horizons online course sufficient for their phonics instruction? Yes, because it is an OG based program. Um, and it, there's an, uh, an at-home course. So yes, students, um, it doesn't matter what the grade is because there are two programs, one for K3, one for um, fourth through adult. So one's discovery, one's elevate. So yes, they're certainly appropriate for that. Um, any other questions? So again, just a reminder that our next um, webinar is gonna be on March 24th and we will focus much more specifically on, um, on all the things that go into intervention. So if what the school says, yes, we're going to provide your child intervention because they don't need an IEP or a 504 plan to get support. When the schools identify that there's a problem, then the whole point is that we get your child the support they need. And that happens in reading intervention or math intervention or whatever that is. And so we wanna make sure that 
um, that is being, uh, you know, addressed with the school and that you're keeping track of that. So the parent guide that we're going to send you the link for to tomorrow will kind of have a step by step. These are the things that you would want to do um, if you don't feel like you're getting a lot of support from the school or maybe the school doesn't even know what to do. Um, a lot of places are not really addressing dyslexia or they won't even let the teachers um, use the word. And they also um, aren't requiring training for their teachers about dyslexia. So often the teachers don't know what it is they're looking for. Um, so if doing Reading Horizons Elevate, do I need a tutor? Um, I think, you know, programs are great. I think as depending on what the needs of your child are, a tutor is always really, really helpful at least initially to, you know, if they're qualified, they can, they can speed the process up so much. Um, they can just see things. I just started working with a see, third grader um, last week. And um, I mean, first session, I could just already tell some stuff. And so the more, the more eyes you've got on the issue, the better, um, especially if you've got somebody who is very knowledgeable, but again, that's where I would start with decoding dyslexia, using their parent guide, doing the screener, watching the webinar I mentioned and things like that. So you'll get all of that tomorrow. Any other questions? And again, go to the RISE website and that's where you'll find the dyslexia screener and other resources. And then we hope to see you back in, um, on March 24th. So thanks very much for joining us tonight.